So I think that we'll go ahead and start um, without John. I think that um, when we get to the um, PowerPoint presentation, um, there's kind of three key areas. I think that um, if we can just go through the, the, the transformation plan portion quickly, because I think the main part that we're looking at is the center of innovation process and how to like how to engage the board as we move forward, and then second some background into what's been happening at Ottawa Hills around that. Um, the um, and then we'll hopefully have time to discuss the academic achievement committee. So, so thank you, Dr. Baker. Yeah. You've already provided an overview an overview of the afternoon. Uh, I would just add one thing: we won't be having a report by instructional council. Of course, they have not met since our last meeting, so we will proceed yeah. with When do they typically meet, so that way we is can... It the, I think it's the third, uh, third yeah. Thursday of yeah. each yeah. month. Okay, third and Thursday, so okay. You will have a report the next time that we meet. You know what, while we're at it, and kind of stalling a little bit to give John some time, um, let's uh, confirm when our next, because um, I know that our next We've not been following our planned uh, meeting time because um, January of the change in, in <clears throat> this month um, and then next time when it's scheduled, it would regularly have been scheduled would be um, during spring break. spring break. And the other thing that happened, for some reason, my phone when Julie sent the um, thing to reserve the dates is that I am scheduled to be here every Thursday until the end of the year. I know. My <laughs> so so me. now I don't know which <laughs> Thursday I'm supposed to be here. So um, when are when do we have the next meeting on our schedule? I just want to. I have it. Okay. Or do you, does anybody else have it written down? I don't have it with me. So, okay. We, yeah. It is second week. The 18th of March, April. April 18th. Okay. That's not what you have, Ron? So I have a, uh, there's a one on the 7th, which is today, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> and that's. Correct. Absolutely. April 18th. April 18th. And that's good as far as all of our other plans. Have any other big meetings? Oh, April, by April 18, we will have no need for more mm -hmm. big meetings. So, okay. okay. All right. Thank thanks. You. So we'll go ahead and get. Dr. Baker. Yeah. Uh, for the record, um, we should schedule probably the next two. Um, because the May date looks like it's off as well, so maybe at some point we need to just confirm. Yeah, I think that Julie might have accounted for that, okay. but... Um, May is the second. <laughs> May 2nd, is that what? Yes. That's what I have, but it's such a short time after that, and so mm -hmm. um, it's just a couple of weeks, few weeks, and we were going to do the evaluation in May, and so I just need to know the date is going to matter. Okay, how about if uh, maybe I can meet with you and we can okay. just discuss. And we, so we might consider changing that date. We do have to make sure it's... Well, if there's one yeah. month, I can pick it up. Okay, all right. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to uh, the Center of Innovation process. So th over 10 years ago, we started the Centers of Innovation. And before I dive into the, in, and I'm going to be brief on the beginning of the Centers of Innovation, I just want to highlight from a balcony level the success of the, of the Centers of Innovation. Because today, what we really see as a result of doing them is a system for improvement and sustainability, which is pretty remarkable when you look at the effort that's been put in. And that system, I would highlight the system for innovation, 
within the district. If you look over the last 10 years, how much innovation we have brought into the district, the system for uh, having strong, productive partnerships externally, and then a process for responding to student needs. And lastly, I would say the continuous learning process. When I was preparing for this, I realized how much of this uh, early beginnings of the Center of Innovation really led us to where we are today. Um, I want to build a little bit of context, and I think you have the slides. If you can do the guiding principles and goals. I'm not going to read all of these to you, but I want to highlight a couple of things that I think will um, show you the implications. Because the context for the Centers of Innovation, this is 12 some years ago, if you recall, our high schools desperately needed change. We had just started some community conversations, and the third really important piece is charters were knocking at our door. And if you recall, uh, for those who were around at that time, UPREP was really at our door. And they were wanting, they couldn't decide, do we want to be in the district or do we want to do a charter or did the, the district want a charter? All of those three things, along with some thinking we had, we knew we had to increase student performance. At the same time, we were recognizing that we needed the community and the community was recognizing they needed us, but we hadn't quite figured out how to work together. That all emerged out of this process of centers of innovation. Um, so I think that's an important context because when you look at the purpose, you'll see fostering public-private partnerships was one of our uh, purposes for existing. And then when you look at the goals, we actually have achieved those goals. We've expanded school choice, We've increased student achievement. We reduced the racial gap, uh, achievement gap if you look at our grad rates. We build strong relationships between students and staff, and we transferred knowledge and best practices throughout the district as evidence of wanting to do this in Ottawa Hills. Mm -hmm. And these goals are in your packet of the um, Centers of Innovation, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. But I think about the last seven years, how much we have gained from the experiences of starting these centers of innovation three years prior to Teresa taking on. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. So then if we go to the early partnerships, because in change there are, early, uh, there are always early adopters. Those who will say, hey, I'll get on board with you, I'll try this out with you. So if you look at your slide, you'll see um, six early adopters. And so they really had to just start the conversation with us and say, how do we work together? What's a productive relationship? I think you're familiar with all of them. Perhaps I don't know if people know about the Nokomos Foundation. And that was Twink Fry's uh, foundation as part of the uh, Fry uh, family. Mm -hmm. She was the sole sister, so she got to... <laughs> got to have her own foundation, and she was very focused on women's issues. And at that time, we were working towards a girls' school. I don't know if some of you remember that. And she was instrumental for wanting to start that single-gender school. So I just want to highlight uh, those foundations because as early adopters, they really helped us uh, to encourage us, to support us in this new venture, and really be, start that whole uh, development of what does it take to be good partners. Um, and some new work where we didn't really know where it was going to emerge. You know, you're starting a concept. It might look good on paper, but how does it really result? So they also recognized for us that the success of GRPS was really critical for economic development, workforce development, and then for the quality of life in our community. And those were important factors, and I think you'll read that when you read some of the context in our, in our notebook. Um, that group, along with uh, an internal group, um, we spent a year studying um, what, were, what did quality high schools look like. So we studied the Detroit ed, uh, the Education Venture, and they had started supporting partnerships there with the Skillman Foundation in AT&T. And then we also went, we did a site visit to Chicago Public Schools, talked to the uh, University of Chicago Consortium on School Research, read a lot, had lots of conversations, and that work actually influenced the work that you see resulting in this notebook, and you have a paper copy of it. Mm -hmm. But this is what the original, this is actually the original notebook. Um, so we really applied that learning to establish a process, a process for writing one, writing an, an application for vetting it, for we had guiding principles, and we had uh, talked about advisory boards, which are still in existence today. Um, so when you think 12 years ago, those, those um, advisory boards got started and that they're still 
here yeah. present today is pretty remarkable. Yeah, it is. Um, they help us develop curriculum. They make sure our work is connected to what uh, the workforce needs. So we're, we're um, actually, we were able to take the curriculum, the skills and knowledge kids needed to be able to be ready for the workplace. And then lastly, they established the themes which you see on the chart. Um, you'll see the, uh, the first five were the original centers of innovation. The principals had to fill out this application. It was vetted and it was pretty thorough. And then we also um, had Grand Rapids U Prep go through the same vetting process with the same application. And then you'll see what emerged from that is the Ottawa Hills, which has just come on board, and then the uh, Public Museum School, which was a couple years ago. But I do want to make a comment about um, the past seven years um, to take us where we are. Our centers of innovation are as strong as they are because there were some key actions on behalf of the superintendent. One, she pulled all of those uh, centers of innovation, which were sort of just hanging out in an individual high school. You know, they had some, some attention, but not the attention they really needed. They really made a significant difference when they were all pulled together as Innovation Central. That really strengthened them. I would also say the other thing Teresa did was really bring into our district and taught us how to collaborate uh, with external partnerships and build strong, authentic, transparent partnerships. And lastly, is really connecting education with the needs of the community and most importantly with our students. Mm -hmm. So I think there's more evidence that Ron is going to bring in. And John? Time for <clears throat> All right. So this is the actual document that, and PowerPoint that we used um, uh, in 2012 when we put together the, uh, the first version of the GRPS transformation plan. And we thought it'd be really helpful to walk you through oh, yes. um, what, it, what, uh, w what this plan was, how it was developed. Uh, if you flip the next, one of the things you might recall when yeah. Superintendent Weatherall Neal do we have that in it's on it's, it's in the packet it should be in the packet and it's on the screen yep yeah. so the, one of the first things that superintendent did is did a listening to her and among other things uh, she asked what's working um, and so this is kind of the list of at the time we knew some things that were really uh, positive in the district uh, we know we had some of the top performing schools ranked in the top one percent uh, that the city high is one of the top in the nation. Uh, we had significant gains in ACT composite scores uh, under our uh, GR Montessori Union and, and city. Uh, Zoo is ranked the coolest school in America. Uh, we had the nation's first pre-K-12 tuition-free Montessori school. Uh, we had the Challenge Scholars. That was when Challenge Scholars was, uh, was first brought to light to provide for free college. Uh, we had our, our English langu our language centers, which we now call cultural centers. And we had that largest selection of theme schools and centers of innovation. So we had a lot of things that were working for the district. Uh, the other parts that were working was under our operations. Uh, we were recognized nationally uh, as a model for right-sizing reforms and, so and sound fiscal management. Uh, we saw our bond rating go from negative to stable. Uh, we had our bond that was passed in 2004, so there were 10 new state-of-the-art elementary and middle schools. Uh, we had our two schools that were built uh, virtually tax-free, uh, Blanford and University Prep Academy, minus their food, federal food service was the only tax dollars that went into those buildings. Uh, and we were recognized as a national leader in green, lead certified green-built schools. We also had the KSSN, the community school model, was a first of its kind in Grand Rapids Public Schools to start. It's since spread to other areas. So this gives you an idea of kind of what went into what we knew was working. And so uh, what the superintendent did at that time is she said, we can't, um, we have to remember what were some of those things that were done before she became superintendent. We wanted to honor and respect the work that was done with the five-year strategic plan that was done in 2010-2011, the GRPS academic plan that was for first quarter of 2012. Obviously, the superintendent's listening to her. But we also had that building improvement plan in 2008-2009. In this was the precursor to what we're doing right now with the bond. That We had our bond uh, phase one building improvement plan that was back done back in 2003-2004. That led to the first bond that was passed uh, and the outcome of that phase one said you need to come back in five years or more and look at phase two because we didn't touch the high schools and there were a number of other schools that didn't get touched in that phase one uh, and then um, 
And then we also had the Cambridge Quality Review. This was something when Teresa came in, we had some external partners that offered to support. So they did an independent review of, um, a, similar to her listening to her, what's working, what wasn't, and came up with a series of, what was it, 60 different recommendations in there, almost all of which we've checked those boxes. And so this transformation plan didn't just emerge from the listening to her. It's a compilation of these five different studies and, and elements that were, uh, were part of much of which was part of a, a pretty engagement, a pretty significant engagement process with students, parents, staff, and the general community. Um, this is what we came up, our belief is that uh, with individual effort, high expectations, quality teaching, all children can achieve their academic potential. And our vision is to become a world-class performing district with a diverse portfolio of top quality schools and educational talent to meet the differing academic, social, and physical needs of every student with an unrelenting focus on high achievement, high expectations, and preparation for the 21st century. Uh, we did, uh, and Mary Jo referenced this earlier, uh, thanks to some of the feedback we got from our partners, even as we were developing uh, the Centers of Innovation concept, uh, it got, went to a higher level that said, we need to see the future stability, growth, and success of GRPS beyond being an education issue or just a city of Grand Rapids issue. It's a regional issue, it's a workforce development issue, it's an economic development issue, and it's a quality of life. If we wanna retain and attract the top job providers, talent, uh, and families to live, work, and play in the city, we need a strong, stable, and vibrant public school system. Uh, the goals uh, were, were clear, academics. We wanna increase graduation rates and increase college readiness. Uh, you, I know that, that we just released uh, the graduation rates again. We're up for the, is it now seventh consecutive year and some of the largest gains in the state. I mean, we're up 20 points, which is up more than a 50% increase from where we were in 2012. College readiness, sim similar. We're up 50% or more from where we were in 2012. With the environment, we were looking at facilities because we had a, far too many buildings that were half empty and not be at full capacity. And we wanted to look at how do we increase schools with the 21st century resources. And so kind of to that end, um, we closed 10 schools. Um, and we still have a few schools that are, that are not quite to that 70%, but the vast majority are now 70% or higher. And then the, the increased resources, thanks to the bond approval in 2015 in particular, the technologies upgraded across the, the district, and we have other aspects that we're incorporating. <clears throat> and then the other goal was around culture, high expectations, accountability, customer service. The three guiding values uh, were pretty simple. Invest in what's working, stop doing what's not. <laughs> Invest in talent, talent retention, recruitment, and professional development. At that time, we really only focused on, on teachers and on school leaders, and it really was pretty, it was not as cohesive, coordinated, as professional, thanks to Mary Jo and her team, and really the, our, our, the whole entire academic team, all employees in GRPS now go through professional development. We created, the HR office was completely transformed with the new leadership that Sharon Pitts has done. Uh, we have a talent recruitment, uh, our talent acquisition manager who's actively out there recruiting. So we're certainly seeing those goals uh, reached. And then uh, the last was to provide stability. Uh, we needed to stop the churn. We had 20 years of cuts, closures, consolidations, nuclear style negotiations, $100 million cut out of the budget, 35 plus schools and programs closed, uh, 1,000 jobs eliminated, mostly teaching jobs. Um, but that was like that every single year. We went 20 years uh, and didn't, we closed one or more schools every single year for 20 years. And that led to district-wide layoffs. We reshuffled the principals. We reshuffled the teachers. Uh, parents and students didn't know who their teacher was going to be. They didn't know who the principal was going to be. They didn't know if their school was going to be open in the next year or two. So that stability has been part of the success story because now things have stabilized. There's more consistency consistency, more co uh, stability, more coherence, and that's helped kind of be part of the overall plan of success. So the key elements of the phase one of our transformation plan was expanding the K-8 schools. We heard a lot from the parents. That they really liked the K-8 model. And so uh, we did close one middle school, but we expanded five, K five elementaries into K-8s. Uh, we looked at reinvesting in the neighborhood schools. That, that included reopening Stocking Elementary. That included the work that was being done at Congress Elementary, where you saw a school that was on the brink of closure uh, and one of, the, one of the lowest performing schools in the district to one that has now seen a 100 student increase. Uh, it, their scores are among the top in the district and among top in the region. 
Third one was centers of innovation. We saw the success of UPREP. And so how do we look at centers of innovation and pool the innovation, talent, and resources on one campus? Mary Jo referenced how we had these small schools that were kind of lost in the bigger schools and were kind of dying on the vine to some degree. Uh, we said, let's put them all under one roof. And Innovation Central High School is now one of our top high schools with a 90% plus graduation rate. Is it up to 94 now? I think um, uh, solid enrollment, great partnerships, and uh, really the model for what we're looking to do at Ottawa Hills. Uh, theme schools, we looked at reinvesting. For over years, we had taken away a lot of the, the special supports that made them theme schools, and they were theme and name only. And so one of the things Teresa said is we're going we're gonna to invest in, and restore uh, and expand the number of theme schools. And that's um, one of those included Gerald R. Ford Academic Center, which was where we repurposed that closed middle school. The talent retention recruitment, I think I touched on that already. We, we've been very aggressive and, and studied best practices from some of the local corporate entities. Uh, where can we go to get that talent? Uh, went to school uniforms, uh, maybe not the most popular among students, but was relatively popular among the, the parents. Uh, that was one of the two non-negotiables. Uh, the other being that we're tearing down 111 College, that ugly building that used to stand on the corner of College and Fountain. Uh, we reduced the number of comprehensive teams from three to two for athletics. That was, was with the closure of Creston High School. Uh, central office reform, continuing to restructure. And then, of course, we also closed 10 buildings, including a high school, which typically is very difficult, but we had a 9-0 vote. We had hundreds of letters of support that came out in, in support of this transformation plan. Phase two, which we were very clear at the time, was dependent upon passage of the bond. And Teresa said she would not ask the voters for anything until uh, we could prove the success of phase one. I think I verbalized that. But here's where we outline uh, the, the developing new school choices with the Public Museum School, the expansion of the International Baccalaureate. Uh, we didn't end up doing the full Arts Academy, Pre-K-12 instead. We ended up doing a Pre-K-5 based on a feasibility study that was done uh, that the donors said, we really want to we, we start smaller, and that's also doing IB at Sherwood Park. Uh, we are looking at how do we explore uh, expanding zoo, expanding CA Frost, expanding Southwest. Uh, two of those three we've done already, or are in the process of doing. Uh, the neighborhood school kind of reclamation uh, park, uh, the projects have focused in on Congress and Mulek. We've since expanded that to Brookside and are looking at other areas across uh, the, the state. The central campus master, across the district, excuse me, uh, central campus master plan development, uh, this is part of the downtown Grand Rapids Inc. And it's something that is in, thanks to the voters and the taxpayers, we will be investing, I believe it's $24 million in bond to implement the site plan that was developed with the architects, Lot 3 Mets, uh, and the downtown Grand Rapids Inc. School uniforms, continuing to phase it in. Talent retention recruitment, we're continuing to, uh, to do that. Same thing with central office reform. So those were the core elements of the GRPS transformation plan. All right. So are you, are you going to transition to Ottawa Hills? I am. Could we go back to, I want to, because I'd like to go back to the center's image. So there was a page that had a list of the Innovation Central Schools and then Public Museum, et cetera. Um, so the reason I'm asking this, and, and I know that might end up doing is that even though we have this application package, I know for sure that not every one of these things went through the exact same process, right? So they all have their own distinct stories. Uh, and the top five went through that process. Um, I mean, well, no, well, actually, no, no they did. I'm sorry, you're yeah, right. yeah. The yeah. top the four. Did not. Yeah, and the top bottom two. Yeah. And then the, uh, but even some of them, like the Academy of Modern Engineering, that predated. There was there was grab set. Yeah, yes. Yes. and then right. the design and construction predated. So I think that. Um, and I think that as, because one of the reasons I wanted to review this is that how do we create a process for making decisions in the future? And this, uh, I, I remember this um, in, uh, too well, but, um, you know, but, it, but it's design. I mean, I remember this was, uh, you know, this kind of somebody approaches us, we send them through this process, et cetera. But, but that's not exactly the way everything ends up happening. Not, so I, I would agree, because what you put on paper in the law becomes yeah. reality. Right. Right. You adjust so, and you tweak. Yeah. So that clearly happened. That clearly happened with this process. In fact, when I was looking through this to 
review for today, I was thinking, wow, there are some things I don't even know that I would say would hold all for today. Because remember, this was written in 2006, 2007. Right. No, I think it's a really great so, document. I think it and it worked. Yeah. I think that it's just that I know that each of these have their own stories too. They do. And You're so, right. and it's about cultivating relationships. It's about us approaching people. Sometimes it's about people approaching us. Mm -hmm. It's et cetera. I mean, the museum school has its own story. It may have on. I remember the museum school innovation uh, proposal was was thick with a whole bunch of stuff in it. Um, and but. It, but it was years in the making too. It wasn't just that somebody came to us. Is there a way that you could just kind of briefly go through those that we know, um, just each of these that are on here and how they ended up coming about? So starting with design and construction, I know that that was at Union. How long has it been around? So the Academy of Design and Construction was of course at Union High School. It had a different delivery model. It was an online instruction model where I believe they used NovaNet at the time. And then the students, uh, were, of course, they had design and construction classes where they would go to job sites much like they do now. Uh, Is it, how long, do you know, when did it start? So, uh, let's see, actually, uh, I know someone who was over there uh, and probably, gosh, <clears throat> I would say eight or nine years ago at least. Oh, yeah. it was, it was, no, it was, it was before that was before I got here. And I, yeah. that was, yep. yeah. It was the school was of construction in, that morphed into okay. all of the partnerships and the online delivery model, et cetera. And then we moved it over and put all of them together. Right. We still kept the construction piece, but went to a traditional form of instruction. Okay. The three that started the same year was design and construction, health science and technology, and business leadership and entrepreneurship. Okay. The modern engineering was Grep's up. That's right. right. So, okay, health science and technology. So I was here when that started. That was with Spectrum. That was with Spectrum Health. Mm -hmm. So how did that come? Spectrum approach GRPS, GRPS it, was Yes, both. it okay. was both. Um, Dr. Luis Tomatas, I don't know if you recall who he is. Uh, he worked closely with the DeVosses and he was actually uh, Rich DeVosses' personal physician. Um, he was a cardiologist. And so he was uh, working with Burt Blakey and that's how that one started, okay. is to have health science and technology. It went along with the Van Andel Institute. And so we were strong partnerships with, um, with Spectrum, obviously. And I recall, I can't think of his name now, who was president of Spectrum at that time. Uh, wasn't the most recent one. It was two, Matt, two back. Uh, yes. Ben Rankin? Yes, yes, <laughs> that's who it was. Uh, we worked with him uh, personally, and then he also had some staff that worked with us. So that's how that one got started. And it's at and it was at, at Central. Then Central High School. That which one is was original. right in the middle. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to recognize there's it makes a lot of sense. It was a block away from this large right. hospital complex. So. Right. And the whole notion we wanted there were two things. One that our students would be able to walk to Spectrum University University, Spectrum Hospital, and be able to do internships and or um, employment. What got in the way was the age of the students. You know, and some of, some of the areas of the hospital you can't go into until you're at a certain age. The second thing was starting the ETM with Meyer, and I think you were with me, Teresa. Yeah, when but we before you on, that. so I just want to, so I, I also want to set the context for why it was important to move them all together. Okay. So health science, so like design and construction, health science and technology was was the same model, NovaNet for Gen Ed or whatever the system was, and then their core class. Right. So that was that ended up leading to these internships. Because so. the challenge was trying to do what would be called electives that would serve, and then how do you get your core content classes? That was the right. challenge. Right. And then the last one that was one of the original ones was uh, business leadership and entrepreneurship, and that was with Amway. Um, they had, and I can see the people, but I can't remember their names, but they, again, it, it was a... Um, a collaborative effort because remember the next slide or the two slides later where I list all those um, partners, they were part of the conversation. So they knew what we were trying to develop. And so there were um, representatives from Amway. That's it. Thank you. She Teresa. still works with them. Right. Right. Yes. Okay. That's right. That's right. right. And that was detrimental. 
that was not the best model. But that was a struggle of small schools back in that day, too. Again, you know, we're talking 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and then Amway also invested in some of renovations at, the, um, at Ottawa Hills. And Rodney Lewis was the one who started that. Right. And so then, um, and then modern engineering was GRAPSEP, right? It was. It was uh, when the GRAPSEP uh, program ha it had a partnership initially with Davenport University. Uh, Davenport University and GRPS under that particular model. I really decided to, Davenport decided to go in a different direction at that time. We uh, wanted to continue with that program because it was a strong STEM program. We changed it to the Academy of Modern Engineering where uh, the uh, project Lead the Way was incorporated into it, uh, PLT, the PLTW curriculum. And so that's still a, a very strong program at Innovation Center. I would just add there was also a state funding component to the GRAPSEP. There was Detroit, Correct. yeah, DAPSEP right. and GRAPSEP, and they were <coughs> annually <coughs> receiving, yeah, I was going to say two hundred fifty to 500000 and then that state appropriation uh, was eliminated. <clears throat> so that was part of what mm -hmm. led to Yeah, good catch, John. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, and then so, the last one that happened at the same time was UPREP. And right, so those four, though, so if we talk about those four, what was the rationale? Just go ahead and, and reiterate. Well, two, two, two reasons that I think that we did it. One is what was happening at Central, and then two is what was happening with these four programs when they we were... We wanted to pool the resources, pool the talent, pool the partners, in some cases of which were overlapping in different parts, put them all under one roof. So you had that, that kind of synergy between those four academies all under one roof. It allowed the innovation of those small schools to be able to become alive because you had one principal focusing on those innovations. The, the other thing is, years ago, when Pat Newby was the superintendent, we tried for a Gates Millennium a grant in order to fund small schools. And our parents and our children uh, said that that was something that they wanted at each of the high schools. And so we tried to do it, but we just could not pull it off without going to a computer, a technology-based mm -hmm. program, because we couldn't buy enough teachers in order for everyone to have a true small school. Mm -hmm. So this started with Dr. Newby, actually. And at the same time, uh, Teresa, remember, we uh, had started those small schools, and we didn't have the evaluation law that we have right. today. So you know, And so people started the bumping and moving. So right. we right. we actually had John Stewart, you know John Stewart from the TV. His yeah. mother came and uh, did the professional learning for all of our ninth grade teachers to do small academies, and then the very next year they were all bumped out of those positions. Well, ninety ninety some percent were. Yeah. So you had low enrollment in each of these programs, largely driven by the students didn't like to be online for most of the day, and then. What was the enrollment at Central at that time? Because we closed Central as it was, as a comprehensive high school. Central was actually down to a couple of hundred students. I, I don't know the exact yeah. amount, but when it went from Central, <clears throat> then at 800, 900 student comprehensive high school, to having one academy at the time, or a couple hundred students, and now it's a vibrant high school again right. with, you know better than anybody, yeah. about 800 students there as well. Right, so it's so it's been really good. So and that's the way these things came about. And I would say also, um, again, most of these predate, I guess, most of the people here, except for <laughs> except for Teresa. But there was, I think, that we could see that there was a relationship between the industry and the need for employment and a partnership with the students. So, uh, how about I know teaching and learning happened just last this year, but um, you prep came along, and how did you prep come again? Because it is a bit much different story. They, you want me to tell you that? No, okay. Um, they came to Dr. Taylor when he first came here and said, we want, we want to do this school. And then they wanted it as a charter. So it was through a series of conversations that we really wanted it, and that's how we really got. They, that, the pressure from that school really pushed us as a district become more innovative and come up with the centers of innovation because we wanted the school to be a part of GRPS. So that kind of is where this document yes. comes from. Is that absolutely. Okay, yeah. And then we pursued other academies at the time too that didn't happen. Yes. Right. So mm -hmm. okay. two, uh, two other schools we tried back later that it didn't happen. One was Ellington, excuse me, one was yes. uh, SAP Charter Ellington. We went through the process to uh, open that school, and they chose to go to become a charter school, and uh, has since dissolved. And then the other one, um, we had one other school that we were trying, I'm trying to, to remember, too. The girls' school? 
It was a girl school, and the ACLU said we could not do that yeah. after two I years kind of study. I vaguely remember that. So yeah. I said, yeah. So I was like, so. okay. Um, so anyway, but the University Prep Academy came out of that. And then the next one that's more known is the museum school. So how does that, John, why don't you answer this one? How does the museum school happen? Uh, well, I think you went running one day with Dale Robertson. <laughs> I didn't um, mean for you to go that far back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but in all reality, I mean, that, you know, I think it was at that time when we were really starting to think about how we can innovate. And uh, we've had such great success at Zoo and Blandford and these kind of site-based, place-based uh, schools. And I, Dale had said he'd always thought it would be great to have a museum school. Uh, somewhere along the line, Dr. Rosen at, at, at Kendall got brought into it. And then our friends over at Grand Valley's place-based education program. And so kind of one thing led to another. We started getting together and pulling our academic team. Carolyn was part of that um, and, and said, what, you know, how do we do this? And I think one thing led to, we actually used the Center of Innovation application to help guide their the, the thought process. And, and Dr. Rosen kicked in some funding for a consultant to help organize, and it just kind of caught fire. I mean, we went, we visited uh, the Henry Ford uh, uh, Museum School down in Detroit, uh, studied some of the other similar models, and, and it really just kind of blossomed from there. The, um, the COI process that is really great for the district, uh, the transformation plan has to be flexible enough for partners to come to the table mm -hmm. um, without all the answers and, and yet have a process where just anyone can't come and open a school, right? right? So, so it's a both and. It's being flexible for children and partners and it is what is in the best interest of the district students and the partners. And so you want to, and a great example of this is the Academy for Teaching and Learning. We could not grow our own, and we tried, and it was Ferris that said, okay, well, Dr. Baker, that said, how about we do this? And the transformation plan was flexible enough for us to do that. The exact same thing happened with our Academy of Culinary Arts, and that was Grand Valley State University. They said, we have this $4 million. How can we help you with the small school? And so you want, you guys want to keep it both flexible, mm -hmm. right? So partners can have a voice because you can't do this without partners and internships and people willing to help the lift. It costs millions to open up one of these schools and so your partners will have to bring money to the table. So could you, so the, um, the talk about culinary, so how does, so for culinary arts, hospitality and tourism, how does, so, Grand Valley is doing this in terms of education, right? Mm -hmm. And certainly there's a there's a growing hospitality tourism mm -hmm. systems and how did you how did they convince GRPS that it was that it was worth GRPS's point to do this? So, so oh, go ahead. So within my Ottawa Hills component yeah. of this presentation, You're talk about that. I can address it or we can answer now whatever you like. No, let's go ahead and wait because I wanted to. Okay, but I think that we can move on to I just wanted to make sure that we had these stories. I think that one thing that I think is important for us to maintain with a transformation plan, I would say isn't so much the specifics that came out of the transformation plan. It was the process that was, it was a responsiveness to the community and local industry. And I think that that's something that we want to make sure is, as we make uh, these changes over the next year, that it's that there are always relationships with the community. So when I asked you these story, you knew that there was so and so from Spectrum or so and so from Amway. That there is these responsiveness. It isn't just somebody had an idea and let's implement it. So anyway, Ottawa Hills. Wonderful. So uh, my colleagues share with you all of the great things that have happened with our centers of innovation, and now I would like to share with you all of the great things that we believe are going to happen, and some of which are already happening at Ottawa Hills High School. So a little bit of background information. Ottawa Hills was established in 1925 with about 650 students. Uh, that grew over time to approximately 1,800 students. Uh, right now, Ottawa Hills has approximately 500 students. I do not believe that there is a school with more prouder alumni than Ottawa Hills, especially if you are from around the Grand Rapids area. Uh, today I was with the Mayor's Youth Council and there are a couple of colleagues who were there with me today who were shouting out that they went to the O. So there's still a tremendous amount of pride in going to Ottawa Hills. Ottawa Hills in recent years has removed itself uh, from the priority schools list, which is a bonus. 
and at the State of the Schools address a couple of years ago, Superintendent Weatherall Neal uh, informed our community that even though we are making these great strides uh, in our school district, we are only as strong as Ottawa Hills. Mm -hmm. So this is our next uh, chapter. Today I'm going to get into four topics as it relates to Ottawa Hills. I'm going to talk about HBCUs or Historically Black Colleges and Universities, Early Middle College, 2019-2020 New School, which is the Academy of Culinary Arts, Hospitality and Tourism, and then I'm going to share with you the Michigan Merit Curriculum requirements because you need to know as a board what we must do uh, in the eyes of the state to fulfill its requirements. So first up, what is an HBCU? So I have various uh, logos and mascots from all the HBCUs uh, up there on the slide. Uh, an HBCU, of course, is a historically black college or university. There are 107 HBCUs in the United States. And at one time in our country, it was the only option uh, for black Americans who wanted to pursue higher education. Additionally, just some statistics I would like to throw at you as it relates to HBCUs that I think are important. 25% of all BAs in STEM fields for African Americans come from HBCUs. 14% of all African Americans with engineering degrees come from HBCUs. Uh, HBCUs are 26% cheaper than traditional four-year schools. 50% of all of our nation's African American teachers are products of HBCUs. Wow and 70% of all African American dentists come from HBCUs. Wow. So just a couple of additional uh, facts of information as to why HBCUs are so important. Uh, this is something that we are very proud of, is our pipeline uh, to FAMU, so Florida A&M University. Uh, Dr. William Hudson, who's the Vice President of Student Affairs, has made a commitment to the Grand Rapids Public Schools for 10 essentially full ride scholarships to FAM for qualifying students in the Grand Rapids Public Schools. Uh, we were fortunate enough to take a trip to Florida A&M University last year. Teresa, some other colleagues and I, uh, they just uh, rolled out the red carpet for us. We have students from Ottawa Hills who are attending Florida A&M University right now and uh, we hope that continues. Uh, additionally, uh, last year we had uh, two students who received $50,000 scholarships uh, to Florida A&M University and uh, we believe that this is part of our renewed commitment to Ottawa Hills not only at Florida A&M University but as you will see we have students right now uh, in the last two years of graduating classes at Ottawa Hills attending the HBCUs that I have uh, listed in this slide. Additionally, uh, there was a time in the school district where if a student wanted to take an HBCU tour, we essentially had to hitch our wagons with a, a neighboring school district or we had to work with a, a, a national uh, HBC, HBCU tour company. That's no longer the case. Uh, last year at Ottawa Hills High School, we took 77 students over spring break to an HBCU tour. HBCU tour. Uh, we are doing that again this spring break. And yes, the building principal was on the tour last year with many uh, administrators and teachers who are in the building. So uh, that really speaks to commitment that the principal and uh, his team on their spring break are taking an HBCU tour, which we think is absolutely fantastic. Uh, when the students came back, this is a testimonial from a teacher that really resonated with me. Students returned from the HBCU trip more fired up about their studies and doing well on their AC SAT, said math teacher Paul Nelson. On their first day back in class, he said, they were telling me how important the SAT was. They were asking how to get their grades up. Their interest was more than passing. So students came back from the trip super fired up, uh, especially about schools that they weren't thinking about that now were resonating with them as they were thinking about their four-year college experience. Next up, uh, we have the Early Middle College program at Ottawa Hills High School. So this is the second cohort of the Early Middle College at Ottawa Hills High School. Uh, what is an Early Middle College program? So an Early Middle College program is essentially an experience where you earn an associate's degree, a certificate, or 60 college credits while you're also completing your high school diploma. 
Uh, students in the early middle college program, they go to school for year 13. Um, when they're, so it's, it's not like uh, they're in year 13 still at Ottawa Hills. That year 13, students are on GRCC's college campus. So all of the classes in year 13 take place at GRCC. But can you imagine that one extra year of high school gets you an associate's degree and that's <coughs> less college that you and your parents have to pay for. Here are the early middle college uh, requirements at Ottawa Hills High School. Of course, freshman year, uh, we are not asking students to enroll in the early middle college program. Uh, their job is to get a grade point average of 2.5 or above in their freshman year. That is the college's requirement, so therefore we must adhere to that requirement. Program begins in 10th grade. Uh, students take courses, uh, high school courses as well as their college courses, just like I said. Year 13 is predominantly college courses, and the, re the result is just like I shared, that high school diploma and those 60 transferable credits. And one addition is that students aren't spending all of their financial aid dollars, mm -hmm. right? They can wait until their third and fourth year of school to use those dollars, so they're really getting uh, quite a deal from a college tuition perspective. Uh, here are some ad additional benefits that I've already talked about. They're all taught by uh, GRCC instructors. Class sizes are capped at 25. These are GRCC requirements. And the fourth really doesn't do it justice. Students have access to academic counseling support throughout the program. They also have access to everything that the college students have access to at Grand Rapids Community College. Computer labs, uh, assistance on areas where they're struggling, uh, use of facilities, weight room, gymnasium, things of that nature. Here's a sample schedule for an Ottawa Hills student. So in grade nine, of course, there is a traditional high school schedule. Grade 10, they take two courses. Grade 11, four courses. Grade 12, six courses. And year 13, 10 college courses. Notice there are no uh, high school courses in that year 13. Okay, huge benefit. Next up, we're going to transition to our new school, which is the Academy <coughs> of Culinary Arts, Hospitality and Tourism. <coughs> so, as we are planning for the future of Ottawa Hills, just like it was stated before, we are looking to create a model similar to Innovation Central with many partnerships, advisory councils, persons in the community helping us drive the program. As we were planning for uh, this new school, our leadership team and I were very fortunate enough to attend many of the locations. We have a smaller team where Mr. Lewis is taking the lead that's gone to other locations but I had the uh, good fortune of heading to uh, uh, Washington, D.C., Indianapolis, Detroit, Michigan, where we're seeing many of these programs in action. Next up, this is very important. This is called NAF, or the National Academy Foundation. One thing we learned with Innovation Central, it is really time consuming to create curricula from scratch for all of these different academies. So what we found as we were researching all these different cities that there is a company, the National Academy Foundation, that supports school districts in these areas on academy development and instruction, or academy development and structure, curriculum instruction, advisory board as to who should be on it, and really some work-based learning that we're super excited about, especially with some of the programs that we saw in D.C. Uh, before we get into the nuts and bolts of the Academy of Culinary Arts, Hospitality, and Tourism, this is a list that has not been finalized. It's our preliminary thinking as it relates to some of the programs we would like to see at Ottawa Hills based on some of the programs that we've been able to witness as we've toured around the country. Okay, so what, you, what we do have is the Academy of Early, Early Middle College. That's open to every single student at Ottawa Hills. That's something that we're doing now. Of course, the Academy of Culinary Arts, Hospitality, and Tourism, <coughs> that's the one that I'm going to get into greater detail on right now. So to start the process, uh, of course, there's something called a YOP, uh, which is a year of planning. Uh, we are, had, have attended uh, the NAF uh, National, attended the 2018 NAF conference uh, in July. Uh, we signed a, a an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding with NAF, and we said to them, this is what we believe we'll be, we will be launching, this is what we will be, we will be launching in the future. 
uh, we began planning with them, collaborations, uh, academy design team was put in place, there have been many phone conferences, but there are some important conferences that took place because these are folks from, from all over and we can't continue to, you know, to go to D.C. or New York or whatever, so lots of this work is done via phone conference. And then there's an academic, there was an academy design team in March. Uh, additionally, uh, there'll be another visitation in April. Uh, we are hoping, much like we did with uh, uh, the Academy of Teaching and Learning, where you, you hire a teacher uh, who you guide through the process, who helps with the curriculum development, even though they'll be getting uh, much more support than what we've seen in previous programs. Uh, there is a NAF uh, conference uh, coming up, and it's so important that our teams go to these conferences because they can learn from their colleagues who have been in similar situations when we talk about launching academies. Uh, the official launch will be 2019, so of course there are recruitment efforts going on in our middle schools right now. Uh, to ensure that we have a nice cohort of students. And then uh, we'll begin the year of planning process for the next set of academies in September. So once we get uh, this academy off the ground, then we'll be looking to what are we going to do next. Okay. So the Academy of Hospitality and Tourism, here are the outcomes. Of course, it's a no-brainer for us, something we are so excited about. Uh, Superintendent Weatherall Neal took over. This, this district had a 44% graduation rate, and last week the, score, the rates were released. We're now 71%. Uh, we are not finished by any stretch of the imagination. Um, the 80% is, of course, the state and federal average. We believe that we will surpass that with many of the innovative ideas we have mm -hmm. and continue to do what we're doing. We want to increase the number of college-bound students that we have. Uh, we want to increase early college and dual enrollment, so the colleges with which we've been uh, working, uh, they have provided lots of opportunities for our students to have dual enrollment in this particular field. Something that was happening with Marriott in D.C. is that students not only had the unpaid internships, but they also had paid internships. So during the summer, especially for our upperclassmen, they were able to work at uh, various hotels right in D.C. and making a really good wage and learning on the job in their summer. And of course, preparing them for, for workforce readiness. When we look at our partners, and so uh, Dr. Baker, when, when you say, you know, how did all of this get started? You know, we were approached <coughs> by Experience Grand Rapids, we were approached by Grand Valley State, other local colleges and universities, that there are programs uh, there are programs like this around the country, and with the boom that's happening in Grand Rapids, we need to ensure that we have persons to go into these positions from a leadership perspective, okay? So, um, if you look at the kind of the details of the program, it's a project-based uh, model um, with learning techniques emphasizing literacy, project management, leadership, and building teams. Um, you'll notice they'll learn the, the principles of culinary arts, hospitality, and tourism, but also customer service, geography, marketing, sports, entertainment, event planning, and sustainability. One important piece is this is driven by industry leaders, practitioners, persons who do this every single day. And lastly, creativity and innovation. We have to be innovative. We cannot uh, continue to exclusively learn out of textbooks. We have to do more. So here are the future opportunities that we want for our students. Now you'll notice that there are not positions on here like housekeeper or bell person or valet. Those are important positions in hotels and we want our students to work uh, in, those particular, in, in those positions when they're starting off. But we want our students to aspire to these positions. We want them to own the hotels, to own the restaurants, uh, to manage uh, the restaurants, hotels, etc., to be accountants, to be event planners. Um, the, we have so many phenomenal students in this school district and they should be a part of what's happening with this boom in this city. So what are the folks in the industry saying? So Doug Small, who is behind this with Angela Nelson, with also our support from Grand Valley. Just a quote, 10 years ago, we had just shy of 7,000 hotel rooms in the Kent County area. And by the middle of next year, we'll be nearly 9,000. You add that on top, you add on top of that, all the new restaurants, attractions, and other infrastructure in tourism, and you see exactly why we need a program like this. 
So hats off to all the partners that were referenced because they're, they're reaching out to us and saying, we need you and we need your students in leadership positions. Are there any questions that you still have about that piece, Dr. Baker, or others? Yeah, I think that's great. Awesome. Okay, so in addition to all of these innovative things that we are planning on doing, we also must adhere to something called the Michigan Merit Curriculum. Okay, so just really quickly, this specifies that all students who get a diploma, who walk across the stage, have to fulfill these academic requirements. So, really quickly, we need four years of English. We need four years of math, one of which needs to be taken in a student's final year. So even if we have students who are taking Algebra 1 in 8th grade and they go through four years of math by 11th grade, they still have to take a math course in their senior year. There's also an online learning experience requirement. This does not have to be taught in isolation as a class. This can be embedded in some work that happens in other classes. Of course, there is one year of physical education and health. There's one semester of each. In many instances, this class is taught in a student's freshman year. There is a three uh, credit science requirement that all of our students <clears throat> must have. Three credits of social studies, uh, one year of visual performing and applied arts, and there is also two years of language. Uh, students can uh, test out of language, students can take sign language, uh, and students can take also some CTE uh, classes which will fulfill uh, those language requirements. So there is some flexibility. Uh, what we're noticing is many of the small schools around the nation are infusing these standards into the work. A really good example of that is at Innovation Central where students are on the construction site and they are going over uh, uh, many components of geometry in their work. Yeah. So you tell me what is probably, what is something that you will remember more and will resonate with you more, the work you did out of a textbook or the work you did to build a house? My assumption is the work you did to build a house because then all the stuff you learned in class will begin to make sense. Right. So that uh, concludes our presentation. Uh, we hope it was comprehensive. And if you have any questions, please let us know. I have one question. Absolutely. Um, what, what is the rationale that the state has for insisting kids have five years of math? If they, uh, four, four years of math. Yeah, but if they, if they do their algebra in eighth grade, so what do they do their senior year? Uh, so, so senior year, so our students uh, follow uh, algebra, geometry, algebra two, pre-calc, or financial literacy. Uh, if they started out before that, they can move to calculus or some dual enrollment opportunities or things of that nature. They have to, they have to have yeah, the, the impetus is that there really will, there were not graduation requirements in the state of Michigan. So the impetus for the Michigan Merit Curriculum was. These are the minimum standards that student must com students must complete to earn a high school diploma in Michigan. Now, when you count all those up, you'll come up with 18. In the Grand Rapids Public Schools, we have 22. Okay, and on our in our alternative sites, students need 18 credits to graduate because why would we hold students back who are maybe in their fifth or sixth year who <clears throat> fulfilled the state's requirements? So when you ask why do they need four years of math, um, I believe. At the time, there was more of a push for everyone going to college. That's why you needed this college, okay. Sorry, okay. Um, this curriculum that prepares you for college, and I believe it does. Um, now there is a movement also to CTE and vocational ed and things of that nature. Um, so I think that was the impetus. There were no standards, and we wanted to get more kids in school, prepared for school. So one thing that's important that you added this section to the discussion on academies is that regardless of what our students do, they should all theoretically be able to go to college. Absolutely. So, and I think that that's one of the things that I, I think it's unique about Innovation Central and now these other programs is that, um, is that you can make an argument that all of the students there are being prepared for career and or college. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And not choosing at a young age to move off of a college track and to move elsewhere. I, so I think that that's something that we should mm -hmm. keep in mind mm -hmm. as we make, you know, if they're that, and I know that we kind of swung the pendulum back where now we're worried about people 
everybody doesn't need college kind of framework, but I think that as we're making decisions as a board, every academy <coughs> we run should allow a student to go to college. Both and, secondary, something, something. Right, or, or career. I mean, it should be, that, that mm -hmm. it should be, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That it should be so, mm -hmm. um, that it's both. Mm -hmm. what a, a, a 10th grader, if you're choosing an eighth grade to go into the hospitality management program, you're not choosing an eighth grade to, to move yourself off the college prep track. Uh, and the same thing with all of it. And I think that that's important. As, and I think that that's why, and to some extent, I think of it as 21st century vocational school. And I think that you, you guys did a, a conference last year that was meant to get people to stop thinking about the either or. Either or. That's right. that, that, that it's likely that our students will graduate and will, some will go straight to college, but probably all of them will end up in some post-secondary experience because they're going to go do other things so that's I think a, that's got to be a bottom line for where we draw the line for um, Academy so if you can't do it in college or you can't get a job in it after high school then we shouldn't be doing it but they, um, have, they have a skill that they'll have forever that's right. Right. I have two questions <laughs> one is and I think this could deserve a large discussion so maybe just think about it for the future but what is being done district-wide at the middle school level um, to get kids thinking about what their interests are and which of these choices they would be most interested? Um, middle school and prior to that, I think career counseling, career readiness, things are really important. And yes, we're not pigeonholing a student into picking a career necessarily. We're preparing them also for college, but I think um, I think all of our kids could use a little more exploration of what are some choices out there. I think that list of careers could be tripled. Absolutely. And my other question is, um, how are we getting this wonderful stuff out to the families in our community? Because I'm hearing negative things about even this hospitality is being presented as, I heard this weekend at the leadership summit, parents saying, or at the neighborhood summit, parents saying, um, union gets free college and city has all the rich families and we're gonna be taught how to be housekeepers. And I know that's not what it is, and the presentation is showing how rich it is, but that's not what our community is necessarily seeing. So um, those are my thoughts. Yeah, I, I guess one of the things is I, I, li I like what the end in mind, and I want to work backwards to our, our K-8 and really making sure that, that um, we are preparing our kids Project-based, I like that. I mean, that's something that I think we have been um, mentioning a lot and had, and, and it's been difficult for our district to really go towards project-based, at least in our, in our more neighborhood schools. Uh, some of our other schools are doing that. So I'm glad to see that, that we're doing that, but we need to do it in, in our lower grade, beginning there so that they really are ready at this stage for those kinds of things. The other thing is um, the stigma that, that um, Ottawa, uh, that, uh, Ottawa has, and that is that it's primarily African-American. And so when I see you mentioning the, the historically uh, black colleges, what is that gonna do to a person that wants to go there and says, well, that's whatever school. How do we combat some of that perception that might be there. And, and, and again, it's not that we need to fight perception, but, but in terms of choices, really any one of our kids or families could choose Ottawa Hills, right? Absolutely. In terms of school of choice. And Absolutely. so that's something that we really need to emphasize to any one of our uh, residents living anywhere within city, that city resident that, that goes to our district, that those opportunities are there. And so, the other is, how did we communicate to our current parents at Ottawa Hills these options that are there? Uh, was it an open house and how many came? And, and those kinds of things where the parents said, oh, wow, look at this. And now, little Johnny, I want you to 
I, I want you to take advantage of this. How, how, how are you guys working or have worked with you that? You know, so I always <clears throat> think there's room for improvement from a, from a school communications perspective to, to ensure that everybody gets the information, right? But when I, th when I think about a school um, like Ottawa Hills that maybe a couple of years ago sent three or four students on an HBCU tour, when we had to maybe partner with another school district, there's a tremendous amount of communication that goes into getting 70 students over their spring break to commit to a trip that will benefit them in the future. Mm -hmm. So there are parent meetings uh, that go into that. Not all students are going to be qualified for that particular trip. As it related to the early middle college piece, we put a full court press on the middle school families to ensure that not only they knew that these options were available, but we also ensured that they knew the benefits of these options. So uh, are there times when we will have a meeting and the attendance is not as good as, as we want it to be? Absolutely, but then it's up to us to ensure that we're having more modes of communication to get everybody there. Uh, Dr. Baker, I know he goes to the events uh, at Innovation Central High School. Superintendent Weather O'Neill was just the, the keynote at the, at the last Innovation Central. The gymnasium is filled with parents. The gymnasium at a high school for a recognition night where we're acknowledging students who are on the honor roll or the dean's list or who are improving. That didn't happen overnight. Mr. Mr. Frost in that particular building is probably, besides John Helmholtz, the best person to recruit students to this school district and recruit them to events, right? So there, we need to ensure that if one uh, style of communication is not working for our families, we need to try another. Where Mr. Frost goes up and down Michigan Street to tell folks, hey, donate to this or that, we need to do the same thing. And I believe that we are getting there because we're gonna take 70 more kids on an HBCU tour. We are going to fill this new program at Ottawa Hills. We're putting a significant investment into Ottawa Hills. Our kids deserve it. I think we it's also the role of the board too. So, I mean, one thing that's, that should be clear is that Ottawa Hills High School has a traditional Ottawa Hills. It is a comprehensive right. high school. Mm -hmm. It is also high school has a partnership with HBCUs. It is also a school that has a middle college in right. it, and then next year it will have this new academy. That's right. um, I think that, and it, it disturbs me when I hear you know what you said, Kim, and you know, really what you were applying to. And I heard this even during the campaign. People say, well, we need a an academy of teaching and learning in our neighborhood too. And I'm like, well, the academy, the reason. I mean, you got to think about this is why I want people to know the, 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 the construction program was at Union, the predominantly uh, Latino side of the city, and the entrepreneurship program was in the African-American community, and the engineering program was on the northeast side. The purpose of bringing them together also created, got rid of the geographic boundaries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I certainly don't, I think that we have to make a commitment to these academies as being something that gets students past the limitations of the geographic boundaries of the city. Right. And that hospitality management is something that everybody in the city can become a part. It's not for African Americans on the southeast side, and that's I mean that's but so, that that that's the board work. But it's also like um, I don't think that we have to we have to work within the city that's created these geographic limitations. But it's also the community's responsibility. Mm -hmm. People should not see. Innovation Central is something that's not in their neighborhood. It is a theme school. You, people send their kids to city from all over the city, right? And it's a and it's a great school. Um, people should send their children to Ottawa Hills High School so they can become owners of mm -hmm. hotels. Mm -hmm. So I would just add a few things. And we spent just on the Academy of Hospitality and Tourism. We've done more than twenty thousand dollars in direct advertising from from cable to the, all the newsprint uh, to door-to-door. Uh, -door. Uh, we are actually doing something cutting edge with Experience Grand Rapids where we've developed a flyer. And the flyer is very similar to what Ron, it is very much outlining the, the high-level career opportunities. Um, and their flyers are being sent home uh, with the employees of the various hospitality and tourism entities across the entire region. So we're going right to those families that may already be embedded in the industry Industry. And so um, the Rodney Lewis and their team are visiting every single eighth grade classroom in the entire district. We have a contract with Link where they are out 10 hours a week and we're sending them to various locations for special events. 
We're getting ready to do a booth out at Woodland Mall. So we're, it, it, there's a comprehensive approach to how we do our marketing and communications. The We Are GR newspaper goes to all every single residential and business household in the entire city, plus it's mailed to parents that live outside. So there is no silver bullet for how we're going to market and, and recruit. It is roll up the sleeves. The best thing we can do is when Rodney was there, he's got 60 kids who filled out a form that said, I'm interested in this academy. So what we found with all of them is the hustle is where it comes. It's the principal, it's the partners, getting out in the community, getting in the classrooms, and actually really educating one-on-one -on -one what is this school. And so <clears throat> anytime you get something like a negative comment like that, tell them to call, call our department, or tell them to call the school. Let's get the story straight because there's actually a lot more to this academy. And I think that there sometimes perception dies hard, but we just need to keep coming with the facts because once they know, they'll realize that this is a, a cutting edge college career prep academy. That's just one of a few that are going to launch in the next few years. Now, when you say that uh, Mr. Lewis is going out and uh, talking to all these eighth grade kids, are they also talking about the other programs or just the hospitality one? He's just talking about yeah. this particular program. Because <laughs> Mark Frost does his programs. Okay. Oh, all yeah, right. Mark. Okay. Mark does it. Yeah. Okay. So it goes to every eighth grade or every grade. Correct. Okay, good. Correct. Good. So I, uh, we're kind of at our hard stop, though. A couple of things I'd like to see, and I'm sorry if people wanted to have the conversation longer. But, you are um, the one who set the time. <laughs> I, well, and everybody everybody out there was like, yeah. <laughs> so, I'm here. Um, nice. So... <laughs> Um, the, um, I'd like to continue this conversation, but I, I'm not quite sure how. One is I think that, I do think that the, especially the fact that this academy um, movement is not something that is located at Innovation Central High School. It's a national conversation. It, the only reason I know about this national conversation was because of the Academy of Teaching and Learning mm -hmm. um, and bringing Rodney up to Ferris to kind of <coughs> consider some partnerships. So. I don't know. I mean, we'd have to talk to Christian and, um, and Teresa, but it would, I think it would be nice to just have a presentation in a regular board meeting about yeah. what are national academies. I mean, what's the National Academy Foundation? Mm -hmm. That this is a kind of a new, and I, don't, I think that, again, it helps the board to be advocates because, mm -hmm. again, for us, it's still, you know, high class vocational schools because we're not really sh we're not really aware that it's a national right. model. And I and I think we should point out how everybody is taking two years of language and everything. And that, and that, going to be uh, exactly. Math for five so years and I think that that years. that will help. You know, the other know. thing I'd like I mean I'd also like to um, find a way for the board to help rewrite the Center of Innovation application to to state on paper some of the things that you guys have learned, like what are the relationships? Um, how does this lead to college and career? Yeah. And I, I say it so much so is that, so that way we have a guide for the future when we're making decisions in the future, uh, as especially if we, we change things. What is the relationship? What's the strength of commitment to the partner? You know, is this just somebody that comes in and does this, you know, um, how will the board approve it? What's the consistency of the uh, merit curriculum? Um, what are the geographic considerations? Is this going to help us draw from across the barriers or we do? So those are two things I'd like to see, but I don't know if, if it's okay to request um, at least a presentation at the next board, regular board meeting to have a presentation on just the academy model, because I think that we need to do a lot more communicating mm -hmm. uh, with the board. Because again, it's really nice to have that history, but most of us don't have that history. So. And you guys should be thankful that you don't. But anyway, <laughs> uh, also on the agenda is um, the discussion on the Academic Achievement Committee definitions of responsibilities. Um, so Christian and I talked um, on Monday, and she would like to have us kind of re-commit uh, to what our role our role is as a committee. And so um, we can do that in the future, but what I'd like to do is, one, everybody to read the committee um, description as it stands now, and then also if each of us can just Google other school boards and see what their policies are on. So it's in the policy handbook. Yeah, and it's, it's on your, it's linked to the, um, the electronic, yeah, the board docs. Um, if you can, and you can just read it. It's fairly vague. It says, it sa basically it says is that the board will approve policies and proposals. 
which is kind of what we are trying to do right mm -hmm. here, um, mm -hmm. in that we would um, we would work with not we wouldn't be making decisions, but we'd work work with the administration to guide policies and procedures. Um, I'd like to have some specific things that like to happen, like I, I'd like to have in writing that the instructional council is part of the academic achievement committee. I'd like to say in writing a handful, but if if you guys can just kind of on your own time Google and see what mm -hmm. other school districts do. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you, you, you talk about having a lot of time. You're welcome to bring us a long <laughs> list of other school district policies. Well, that's so. what I will do. So that's what that's referring to. Okay. All right, so, um, so thanks for it was a very thorough yes, and big, uh, uh, big meeting. So um, let's continue going forward. And the next meeting we did establish again is at April 18th. Yes. All right, so we'll see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.